Hello, online film students. It has taken me a little while to get to this, but uh, here I am. So um, the first thing I did was I recorded you a, sh um, a lecture on psychology and cinema. So take a look at that one first. Um, and um, hopefully that will give you a little bit of background to some of the things we'll talk about. <laughs> we, I will talk about in this video. Um, and with that, if you want to pause the video right now and go take a look at that come back to this as you wish, but I'm going to roll along. And I want to begin not with what you see on the screen, but uh, what is there? So the first thing to do is to figure out what the general premise of the, um, of the article is. And the general premise is really this question, is cinema and all of our media generally teaching us something or acting as a tutor, tutor, like you, when you go to the math tutoring session and you get tutored on math, you're basically being taught, but in a very kind of um, particular way as opposed to a fairly abstract way. The question is what, if this, if the answer is yes, the question then is, okay, so what is being taught? Uh, it's not like uh, we're watching educational videos every single time we watch a Marvel movie or anything. There's definitely fun, something fundamentally different between these. What the premise is, is that these films, all films, all mainstream film, is quote unquote teaching us the very code. This is a term that... Um, uh, Daniel Dayan will use over and over again the very code that allows us really to go about interpreting these things. It is at the same time teaching us the same this um, idea ideological point of view without actually overtly teaching us anything. So, um, like I said, go look at how the psychology thing works a bit, just really superficially, uh, so we can you can kind of get an idea of what this whole symbolic and imaginary is. Um, but let me get to the subpoint there before I move on. The concept of structure and cause that he mentions. Um, and so early on in the article, and and unfortunately, I do not know what I have done with my my um, eighth edition of the book. So I only have my seventh edition of the book. I, I can't really give you page numbers. It's not going to help you. But at any rate, a couple of paragraphs in, uh, he is uh, mentioning the work of this Frenchman by the name of Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss. He also talks about a man by the name of Alain Badiou. Um, and right around, so right around that area, it is... Uh, there's a uh, actually just after the long quote that he gives there. What we have <coughs> is the idea that structure is not only a result to be described, but the trace of a structuring function. The structure points to something that has structured it. Um. And actually, if we go before the long quote from Alain Badiou, it uh, says the point was in this um, idea of structuralism and the move away from structuralism, something happened in the 1960s. The point was to avoid any interpretation of a structure that would make it appear as its own cause, thus liberating it from the terminations of the subject and of history. So the idea is that any work of art is not birth the, the the core principle to approaching a work of art or mainstream media or whatever the case may, may be is not to think of it as being birthed from some sort of um, other world, but that it is structured in the same way that the structure uh, that we live in, the social structure, the ideas of tradition, ideas of uh, stereotyping, gender dynamics, whatever the case may be, how they are structured into our relationships with each other to make them appear normal versus abnormal or right versus wrong. And that what happens with uh, a work of art that we consume, uh, like a film, television show, or something like that, from Daniel Dayan's point of view, is that there is, as part of the code that uh, we are continually being 
tutored on, there is a con a continual um, notion, a sense that the work of art has somehow popped into existence without any sort of causal set of relationships or has been birthed from the idea of some sort of artist. Um, and that is, to some extent, true. But I think I've mentioned this in the class and other places already. It is an incredibly rare thing, certainly in mainstream media, to ever have something emerge from the page as you write it onto the screen as you have written it. It goes through many, many many different iterations and changes. And this is um, exactly what um, Sunset Boulevard and the character of Joe Gillis points to in this um, moment where he's trying to sell the script and the uh, and the producer sets, you know, lies back on the couch uh, and with a cigar and says, I, you know, we could use a Betty Hutton. And Betty Hutton was another important actress at the time, comedian. Um, do you envision it as a Betty Hutton? Let's say it takes place on a softball field. It happened in the bullpen, the tale of a woman or whatever he says. And Joe Gillis says, you know, you have to be killing, kidding me. That's, that's not what I'm doing here. And then he mentions it again um, when he first meets um, Norma. And Norma is, is, has called him back into the house and is showing him into her mausoleum, <laughs> effectively, and these images dedicated to her. And he says, oh, yes, I've written a script about uh, Okies and the Dust Bowl. And he said, by the time I got to the screen, you never would have recognized it because it took place on a, a World War II uh, submarine. So that is the, that's what happens in mainstream film production. Uh, these ideas get contorted and changed and modified and get forced into whatever is the, you know, the interest of the day. So there's a reality here. There's an actual production level reality. Daniel Dayan is not really talking about the actual production level reality. He is talking about how these works um, can appear to be completely separated off from that, you know, um, that uh, production level reality. We don't we don't think about how those modifications have happened, and largely we're not given access to those. We don't have that information. Instead, it seems as though the Marvel movie just was written and popped onto the screen, and um, everybody came together and did their acting, and uh, it, it just kind of rolled out as its own cause. Um, so, okay, so now we get into the psychology part. The symbolic order and the self. This I mentioned in the other um, presentation that I gave, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. But just want to reiterate that the symbolic order from Lacan's point of view is language itself and also social intersubjectivity. So the self is in a network of this symbolic order where you use language you structure all of your unlanguaged stuff, thoughts, feelings, impulses, whatever the case may be. You structure those. You put those into language, into the symbolic order, and you use that to communicate. There's also this tricky one here that says the subject is not the fundamental basis of cognition. And this is, you have to understand what subject means here. Subject means this kind of persona again, to reference a movie that you've seen, this kind of persona that you use to present uh, in this symbolic set of order and relationship that's a little bit disconnected in Lacan from what you think of as your actual self, whatever that case may be, because that process of thinking of yourself, you actually get hung up in that symbolic order because you create kind of a language to think about yourself as a subject. What is it that I want? What is it that I should do? Um, ideas like that. Then we move to the imaginary. The imaginary is the innate level of our self. It is the part of our self that doesn't communicate because it's not symbolic. It is, however, the realm, the literal realm of images. The imaginary is related to the idea, the word image. It is the place where we 
we see things in our head from Lacan. And it is, as I mentioned in the other um, lecture, it's connected to the mirror stage and it's connected to the development through an image of our subject, the subject that we recognize that other people see when they look at us, that type of complicated thing. Finally, um, and I believe Daniel Dane is the one who says this, conjunction of the imaginary and language is what produces the effect of reality. Um, reality, however, is not the real. Reality is a structure. And um, you can think of how reality works as a, as a social structure by thinking about how we use the word nature uh, and um, how we think about the preservation of of you know, uh, animals out there in the world. And I feel like I've mentioned this already, so I may have mentioned this in the other lecture, but let me reiterate here that um, we have animals that we want to preserve. We have animals that we love. We have animals that we like to, you know, look at and their cute little pictures and stuff. And so we want to make sure that they stay living. But and so we think of them as nature. We watch them on the nature channel. We watch them in a television show called Nature. There's this this depiction of nature. That, however, so that looks like reality, but what Daniel Dane and Jacques Lacan, the, the guy who he's drawing from, would say is that's really an effect of reality. It's not actual reality. Actual reality is mosquitoes, um, includes, I should say, mosquitoes and insects that we don't care about and that we don't want to know anything about. And we don't want to think of them as as being part of this glorious natural world out there. We don't want to think about nature as being totally um, in, inconsiderate uh, of us and our desires. We want to think of nature as being a place where we can escape from civilization. But in order to do that, we have to think of it as something other than what it actually is and its raw matter. And that is the effect of reality, effectively. So. Um, now let me move to the next page here, however I can. There it is. So then he talks about this Frenchman by the name of Udar. And you don't need to know too much about Udar, um, but he is borrowing quite a lot from him. And one of Udar's principles is that language is not a part of science nor is language a part of ideology, but science and ideology are both a part of language somehow. They, they are related, but language is not dependent on them in any way. And um, science obviously functions in uh, by escaping, to some extent, this effect of reality uh, very regularly by looking and analyzing the actual real stuff that's out there not how we want it to be in our heads, but how it actually is. Um, however, cinema is a historical product of our human activity. And so it is definitely connected to language. It is definitely connected to us communicating ideas about ourselves to each other. Now he will talk about this painting here, and I have that on the next slide. This is the painting that is mentioned in the uh, in the article. Um, it's mentioned quite extensively in uh, in the article. It spends quite uh, quite a bit of time analyzing it. It's a very important concept that he develops out of this. It's related to something that another scholar by the name of Foucault wrote about, uh, as well as what Udar has written. And and this is where he's going to create this idea of what these codes are by looking at this particular painting. And first of all, the painting from the 17th century involves a painter. I'm not sure if you can see my little mouse here. You should be able to. A painter here on the uh, left-hand side of the image who is looking out. It looks like he's maybe looking at this huge canvas that's in front of him. But he also seems to be kind of looking at us a little bit as the viewer. And then all of these kids in front and these um, and the little person who's here and um, everyone seems to be oriented towards us. Even this guy here in the back who is walking through a doorway 
um, down a staircase, up a staircase or down a staircase, one of the two, he he's looking kind of in our direction. And then there's the question of the mirror slash painting that's on the back wall, suggesting that it's unclear whether this is supposed to be a mirror or a painting. If it's a mirror, then it is reflecting us or the person that the people, because it looks like it's the king and the queen, that the painter is painting. But clearly the subject of the painting are the, are, is the girl here in the center of the painting, who is thought to be the daughter of the king and the queen. So it's um, quite a complicated little setup. Let me go back to my slide that has Udar on it. So one of the things that uh, we have to set up is that painting is discourse using codes subject to changes in history. And that may seem very vague. So let me make it more specific. Those, what he calls uh, one of the codes is naturalism. Um, so he says on fourth or fifth page into the article here, he says, um, Udar advances the following answers. Classical figurative painting is a discourse. This discourse is produced according to figurative codes. These codes are directly produced by ideology and therefore subjected to historical transformation. Um, one such code is naturalism or reality, like the effect of reality. So the idea of creating a painting that looks real, that seems to represent the, the real world in specific ways. If we go back 30 years, 100 years before Velazquez's painting, the style of painting was completely different. But if we asked a painter at that time, are you attempting to represent the reality of the world around you? They most likely would have said yes. And if you ask a modern painter who does nothing but expressionism or uh, whatever the case may be, and you ask them, are you attempting to represent the world around you? The idea would probably be yes. Their, their thought about what representation means is completely different, perhaps. But that's part of this code, the set of codes that go into making determinations about um, styles, the line of sight, the perspective in the painting, the, um, the various ideas or meanings of the painting, all of those are wrapped into the painting, not on the level of the, uh, of the painter as an individual genius necessarily from Mudar's point of view, but from this set of relationships the painter as an individual genius, genius has with the social world around him or her. Um, so to continue in that same paragraph I was just quoting, it, meaning the painting, imposes as truth the vision of the world entertained by a certain class. This exploitation of the imaginary, this utilization of the subject is made possible by the presence of a system which Udar calls rep representation. It manifests the idea, the point of view, the vision of a certain class. And that is, of course, the class who is paying for the painting in this particular case with Las Minas by Velasquez. Um, now, Las Minas is an amazing painting because um, from Foucault's point of view, what it is doing is actually representing those codes to the viewer who is astute enough to understand what's going on. Um, Foucault calls this, this is on the same page, Foucault calls this representation of classical representation because the spectator, usually invisible, is here inscribed into the painting itself. Thus the painting represents its own functioning, but in a paradoxical, contradictory way. The painter is staring at us, the spectators who pass in front of the canvas. The mirror reflects only one unchanging thing, the royal couple, that mirror that's in the background. So it is telling us that it is telling us something. It's effectively what Foucault and others who look at the painting perceive in this painting. The, the artist 
is communicating to the viewer of the painting an idea and telling them sort of what that idea is. This is the classical mode of painting, and I am telling you about it, sort of. There's a um, there's an intellectual almost presence in the painting. So then we get into some of the paradoxical things that are going on. Um, we have the staging of the viewers, and that's what the next bullet here. So Las Meninas uh, by Velázquez and the double stage. On one stage, the painter is sitting, and on the other stage, the spectator is sitting to be looked at by the painting as the spectator is looking at the painting. And so that's kind of that idea of the painter is almost communicating with whoever views the painting by looking out at them, connecting with them, and also at the same time, according to Foucault, showing them what classical representation is all about, how it's put together, what it's made of. It's not a trying to it's not trying to trick you into thinking those people exist on the other side of the canvas. It's trying to communicate how that uh, how that idea of existence on the other side of the canvas um, manifests itself through certain techniques. Um, and it also tries to communicate the importance or the uh, the values of that of thinking of that as a mode of painting. Um, but then he goes on, and this is where Dayan begins to step in. The Romantic, uh, this is on the next page from what I was just reading. The Romantic landscapes of the 19th century submit nature to a remodeling, which imposes on them a monocular perspective, transforming the landscape into that which is seen by a given subject. This type of landscape is very different from Japanese landscapes with its multiple perspective. The latter is not the visible part of a two-stage system. Um, so if we look at non-European artistic traditions, we'll see completely different approaches and different ways of, of this code makes itself manifest. And then we get into this empty or missing subject. The paradox of Las Meninas proves that the presence of the subject must be signified but empty defined but left free. Reading the signifiers the presence of the subject, the spectator occupies this place. His own subjectivity fills the empty spot predefined by the painting. Lacan stresses the unifying function of the imaginary through which the act of reading is made possible. The representational painting is already unified. The painting proposes not only itself, but its reading. The spectator's uh, imaginary can only coincide with the painting's built-in subjectivity. The receptive freedom of the spectator is reduced to the minimum. He has to accept or reject the painting as a whole. This has important consequences, ideologically speaking. Um, when I occupy the place of the subject, the codes which led me to occupy this place become invisible to me. Uh, so once those codes are made visible, and, and he's going to carry this out a bit later, it becomes a bit uncomfortable. There's a... Um, there's a certain level of kind of almost you can think of as background noise that we don't pay attention to. Once you pay attention to that background noise, then it can kind of get annoying and doesn't go away. That's kind of a way of thinking about this. But then we come to cinema. You know, I bet you were asking, okay, when is this going to have to do with movies? Well, it does. Because the movie is a painting to some extent. It... Um, and he plays out how it's an analog to painting, except that it has movement. And that movement can actually um, prevent us for, from connecting or analyzing or, or understanding what those codes are. So there's this kind of game between a revelation and a hiding that is part of the attraction of the moving image. Uh, it seems like it's going to reveal something, but it's because it always seems to be hiding something at the same time as it's revealing something. Um, let me move to the post Las Meninas. Uh, so classical cinema is, is a bit like a painting. 
It's doubly staging the act of acting and the act of being the spectator. And this opens up, as he will say, um, a question of who is viewing this? Who is ordering these images? That's a question that kind of emerges in the, in the unconscious mind of the viewer. Someone has to be the master of putting this thing together. If I look at the Velasquez painting, I know it's Velasquez. Velasquez is a single individual. We know that filmmaking is a collective um, act, but it seems as though someone has to be kind of doing this, presenting it, putting it onto the screen. Um, and so he says, narrative, let's see, I'm going to move up to the top. Uh, this is a couple of pages past. Um, says, specifically, the cinematographic system for producing ideology must be hidden, and the relation of the filmic message to the system must be hidden. As with classical painting, the code must be hidden by the message. The message must appear to be complete in itself, coherent and readable entirely in its own terms, um, like the message of that painting. Not really, his, uh, his point earlier was that the message of the painting, hey, you figure out who it is that you're looking at or who's looking at who or whatever the case may be, actually hides to some extent the underlying code about representation, about the fact that we are looking at the wealthiest members of society and all, and whatever those ideological codes may be. The message must appear to be complete in itself, coherent and readable entirely on its own terms. In order to do this, the filmic message must account within itself for those elements of the code which it seeks to hide. Changes of shot, and above all, what lies behind these changes, the questions, who is viewing this? And who is ordering these images? And for what purpose are they doing so? In this way, the viewer's attention will be restricted to the message itself and the codes will not be noticed. That system by which the filmic message provides answers to the viewer's questions, imaginary answers, is the object of Udar's analysis. Narrative cinema presents itself as a subjective cinema. Udar refers here not to avant-garde experiments with subjective cameras, but to the vast majority of fiction films. These films propose images. I was looking to see if I had this on the slide. I don't know. I, I don't. Maybe I have it on the next, the next one. Yeah, I do have it on the next one. So let me keep going with what I have on this slide. Let's think about eye line matches. So an eye line match is where you see the face of the actor, and then the next image you see is an object. And the next image you see is an object normally from a slightly, if the actor is looking down, then the angle of the next camera, the, next, the shot, in the next uh, image is going to be a high angle looking down on an object to roughly replicate the sense of someone is looking at this. And then we normally see the face of the person who is looking again. So um, what this plays into for from Daniel Dane's point of view is that this process of sewing together these images uh, and pushing the narrative forward is really also at the same time hiding any sort of ideological codes about uh, class or gender or sexuality or whatever the case may be. It hides those away from us so we don't think about the code as it emerges from some sort of social world, but we think of the code or the message as being kind of contained and therefore somehow truthful in an abstract way inside of the image. You see this all the time with the male looking at the female. It it you you are convinced by that eyeline match type of setup that this is a perfectly normal and natural way um, for human males to look at human females and that human males don't look at other males that way and human females don't look at other females that way. All that is part of the classical ideological system. Um, in Las Meninas, the noble family is the reverse shot, but the spectator is put into their spot. So you can think about Las Meninas as sort of being a shot reverse shot. We look at the painter looking at someone, 
but we are the person that gets looked at. An interesting little point about that. Um, and then, um, again, I don't have my page numbers with me. To understand the ideology which the painting conveys, I must avoid providing my own imaginary as a support for that ideology. In other words, one must not identify with the audience in order to understand the ideology being conveyed. Um, you have to kind of, from Daniel Dayan's point of view, step aside from the, the message, uh, narrative message of the film to uh, stare at the film as an object that's a product of some sort of ideological system of codes in order to really get behind the scenes, sort of. Um, so then we get into the suture system. And the system of suture, pretty complicated, um, sort of. First of all, all narrative cinema is subjective, as I was just reading from here. Images correspond to the point of view of a character. They don't, however, correspond to the eyes of a character. So we don't watch a movie. It's very, very rare for you to watch a movie through the eyes of one of a character, of one of the characters that are, that's in the film. It's very disconcerting to have that, to see that technique. It, um, it's not very pleasant. There's something limiting to it. There's something um, unnatural about that. And there have been a couple of films that have tried it, and every single time, it's just it just doesn't work. So we view the world that way. So why doesn't that work? Uh, it's a it's a wonderful question to ask. And the point here is that it doesn't work because that puts us too much into the frame of the film and its limitations. And he's actually going to mention that at some point we come to recognize that the frame exists and we start to ask questions and the movie kind of continually almost wants to prevent us from, from recognizing that frame and from understanding it and from trying and tries to get us back into the film and looking at the world through someone's eyes, you really come to understand I have the power over my eyes. I can turn and look at what I want to, but I can't make this character turn and look at what I want them to. And so it just becomes, um, it becomes unpleasant, really. So that said, we do recognize, we do feel, we do see somehow that what we see on the screen corresponds in some way to a point of view of a character. And generally, it's a character that's there on the screen. But when and so when we see them, we almost as it's almost like we see them in a way that we're seeing their point of view, even though we are looking at them. Um, that's how filmmaking tends to work. Uh, whereas in a uh, uh, you know in a, in a novel, you you understand the point of view of the character because the character tells us things. We see an interiority of the character. In film, you can't see that. So you see the exterior of a character, and it kind of operates as a replacement. So Suture has the function of transforming a seeing of the film into a reading of the film, observation into narrative. And... Um, and here it's at the bottom of the page I was I was quoting earlier. Udar contrasts the seeing and the reading of a film by comparing um, the experiences associated with each. To see the film is not to perceive the frame, the camera angle, and the distance, etc. The space between planes or objects on the screen is perceived as real. Hence, the viewer may perceive himself in relation to this space as fluidity, expansion, elasticity. When the viewer discovers the frame, the first step in reading the film, the triumph of the former possession of the image fades out. The viewer discovers the camera is hiding things and therefore distrusts it and the frame itself, which he now understands to be arbitrary. He wonders why the frame is what it is. This radically transforms his mode of participation. The unreal space between characters and or objects is no longer perceived as pleasurable. It is now the space which separates the camera from the characters. The latter have lost their quality of presence. Space puts them between parentheses so as to assert its own presence. The spectator discovers that his possession of space was only partial, illusory. 
he feels dispossessed of what he is prevented from seeing. He discovers that he is only authorized to see what happens to be in the axis of the glance of another spectator who is ghostly or absent. This ghost who rules over the frame and robs the spectator of his pleasure, Udar proposes to call the absent one or the absent spectator. So this absent spectator becomes the kind of representative of the ideological messaging of this of the film uh, even though there is not a consistent it's not like this is the director it's not what udar and not what daniel day is suggesting it is because the director himself or herself becomes a collection of all sorts of different inputs and codes and and sort of and messaging effectively that is the um that is the uh, classical Hollywood narrative. So the absent spe spectator, two feels what is on the screen and a place from which the absent one looks sort of like over your shoulder or something. So we are seeing what he is seeing almost through his eyes. And in, and in that way, a reading of the film, according to Udar and according to Daniel Dayan, if you read the film, you see that process, you see the idea that you are, you know, you're limited to the point of view that you've been given by whoever's crafted this film. And that it seems to be someone who's, you're, you're kind of looking from, from their point of view somehow. Um, you can think of this, and this will be important for when you, when we get to Linda Williams later, as this type of uh, understanding of how cinema works where we are a basically a, a type of slave to the master that's hidden behind the scenes somewhere and this will be in this will play into uh, a reading that's um the sadomasochistic reading of cinema that we take pleasure from seeing people have pain inflicted upon them. And we also take pleasure in having that pain inflicted upon us. Um, in this case, we enjoy, we take pleasure in the fact that someone else has total control, the, the absent spectator. A shot reverse shot I mentioned already, but this definitely works to hide ideological codes by turning the absent one's gaze into the gaze of a character. So, we kind of have a constant repetition throughout the film that we, there is no absent spectator. There is you're looking at this perspective. You're looking at this uh, this narrative through the eyes of one of these characters, and that we can see happen in the shot reverse shot. Um, but um, the reading of the film will allow you to slip away from that and understand that this is a composite to make sure that it communicates a certain message to you. Code, part of the causal structure, disappears. And the cause is a complete message that stops with the film's ending. And so therefore we come to the very well-known final, final uh, words in this uh, in the article, it says classical cinema establishes itself as the ventriloquist of ideology. The ventriloquist is the person who makes the puppet talk. So it's the ventriloquist who speaks, but we think that the puppet speaks. And that is the way um, Daniel Day is saying cine classical Hollywood, classical cinema, mainstream cinema works. It speaks the puppet speaks. We think that the puppet is speaking, communicating a message, but we don't see that it is the, well, we do. We know it. And this is part of the game here. We know the ventriloquist is the one who's doing this, but we are happy to imagine that it is uh, the puppet who is doing it, who is speaking, who is coming up with the jokes or whatever the case may be. And that type of losing oneself, placing oneself into a type of uh, slavery or the sense of pleasure is one way of thinking about how the film, uh, mainstream film, works on us being kind of masochistic. We want to have our um, sense of of will and determinacy taken away from us in order to feel the pleasure at the film. It's kind of where Daniel Dane is going with this. So I hope that has been helpful.
Um, maybe it has. If it hasn't, you can always feel free to send me some messages and think about how beautiful this image is now in relationship to Las Meninas and what you've read here about the shot reverse shot. We don't get a reverse shot here. She's staring out at us and she is saying, all oh, you lovely people out there in the dark, that's us, that we have produced her. We are the ones who have uh, crafted her. Um, so it's a, it's a lovely ending to a film. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, like I said, feel free to send me any messages. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to explain some things more. I know that you have, many of you have already uh, submitted your outlines for this. If you want to adjust, adapt, modify, whatever the case may be, uh, after you watch this video, you please feel free to do that. It's going to be another couple of days before I can get to grading those anyway. So um, enjoy the rest of the films. I'll chat with all of you, hopefully a bit later. Bye-bye.